Well, hello, everybody. My name is Melanie, and I'm going to walk you through a part of my PhD project that asked the big question, could nanopore sequencing improve today's um, leukemia diagnosis process? So pediatric leukemia affects one out of five uh, child with cancer, and five, four out of five um, patients with uh, leukemia has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So that's what we're mainly interested in. And as for the diagnosis process, well, it can take, in average, 14 days, and it involves a lot of different samples being taken and uh, sometimes being sent to different laboratories to access uh, the accurate classification of the leukemia and uh, find the personalized treatment that will help a uh, patient through remission. And what we found is that actually all these subtypes of leukemia can be characterized by molecular rearrangements, which is very interesting. Uh, so like, for example, hyperdiploidy with multiple uh, copies of a chromosome, uh, translocations, and other uh, biomarkers that have a specific prognosis um, tied to it and potential treatment to help people um, survive this leukemia. So RNA sequencing has been recently uh, used and more and more used to try to stratify and classify ALLs. And it has been because we have found that uh, gene expression profiles actually cluster together by molecular subtypes, which is very interesting and can be uh, used then um, with uh, machine learning algorithms to accurately classify the leukemias. And it can also um, pick up some of the, the, the markers that are very interesting in ALL that are the fusion genes and rearrangements. So that's another kind of thing that we're looking at. But all these methods rely on short read sequencing. So the question we ask ourselves is, could nanopore sequencing improve NGS-based ALL classifications? And we actually talked to the lab next door that developed a pipeline uh, using RNA, so short RNA sequencing uh, data, uh, using gene-level quantification to then classify LLL through classifiers. So they use a feed-forward neural, neural network. This uh, feed-forward neural network has been trained on more than 1,000 LLL samples that all come from short read sequencings. Uh, and so it's gene-level quantification based from short read uh, RNA sequencing. And so we went ahead and took the pipeline, and without changing anything, just as input, provided nanopore sequencing uh, data. So we sequenced. We used different types of sequencing to do that. So we had access to 12 first ALL samples just to have proof of concept. So we took those 12 samples, and we had uh, a sequencing with uh, cDNA on mean flow cells as well as cDNA on fungal flow cells that are cheaper and disposable, and then direct RNA on mean flow cells. So we sequenced all these 12 samples, and the results we got with the, the predictions were really good. So we had almost all the samples um, accurately classified by the classifier with a good prediction. Uh, only, there was only one sample that had a little bit of trouble, so it's the same one for the mean cDNA and the fungal cDNA. Um, and I'm, I'll walk you through that just later, just to explain a little bit what happened. So, but the first, the main question we ask ourselves is how fast can we predict ALL? Because time is really important in this. So we went ahead and divided the, the sequencing run per time points, per um, read, uh, read sequencing time points. And uh, we ran the classifier all over again for all the time points and all the, the data sets. And what we found is very interesting is that so for cDNA on the Minayan, we only needed five minutes of sequencing to achieve a 90% threshold of predict, predicted um, subtype, which was actually the, the, the good subtype. So this is the result we got for the cDNA on the Minayan. And uh, the, the sample uh, that was not what we expected, as I mentioned earlier, was the, the, the sample uh, in blue, the 503. That was actually an atom one rearrangement, and the classifier couldn't find it. And the main reason why is probably because of the training set. Uh, so the atom one rearrangement is a very rare, rare sub, uh, subtype, and it was only like 0.6% of the training set. 
So the, the main problem will be with the strain is that we will have to balance it a little bit better to be able to pick up these uh, very rare subtypes. Actually, we can see here on the figure that the, the blue line uh, appears in the very end of the sequencing, like around, um, I don't remember the time, but one hour or something of sequencing. There was another, uh, another sample that was quite interesting. It was the 1018. 1018 was um, a mix of two, well, a cohabitation of two different subtypes that were high hyperdiploidy and ETB61X1. And what we found is that the, the, the classifier only found the ETB61X1 subtype and not the hyperdiploidy at all. And so we asked ourselves, is there something weird going on with the classifier? So we talked with the, with the cytogenesis, and she actually told us that um, ETV61X1 was the leading subtype for the coexistence of these two subtypes. So that was actually normal not to see the hyperdiploidy, but only the, e the ETV61X1. So we actually found that we can identify the leading molecular subtype when two subtypes are coexisting. So the take-home message we had with this uh, experiment was that RNA sequencing can actually st stratify ALL molecular subtypes, that nanopore sequencing quantifications can be applied to short tree design classifiers, and all it takes is five minutes for cDNA min ion, one hour for fungal c uh, cDNA on the fungal flow cells, and two hours for direct RNA on the min ion flow cells which is very little and help us improve the, the speeds of diagnosis for these patients. So it has really the potential to highly improve <coughs> today's standards for ALL diagnosis and classification, which is a really good point. So now that we have this, this pipeline, it's not fully there yet, but we're getting there. And we would like to modify it a little bit, not modifying the classifier itself, but everything that, ha that goes around. So instead of a gene-level quantification, we would like to apply a transcript-level quantification. And we believe that doing that, we will be able to refine the, the number and the, the characteristics of each individual subtypes. As uh, short read RNA sequencing showed that there are between 17 and 21 mole different molecular subtypes, we believe that with, with transcript-level quantification, we will be able to refine furthermore these subtypes and uh, be able to um, unveil some very characteristic markers of these subtypes. We would also like to use a self-incrementing de novo transcriptomic reference. So for now, the reference that we're using is a public one from GeneCode. And we would like to be able to build our own um, transcriptomic reference from, from all these sequences and all these samples. So we are currently in, uh, increasing the cohort with 96 supp uh, supplementary samples from patients. Uh, and we have access to a very large cohort at Sergio San Justin um, to do that with more than 200 uh, samples available. We're also, also looking at before and after treatment um, or at things like blood versus uh, bone marrow samples to be able to accurately uh, characterize, characterize these profiles, uh, these ALL, ALL, subtype, ALL profiles. Sorry. So with that, I would like to thank all my lab, uh, because this is not a project that I'm uh, doing alone. Uh, there are a lot of people involved, and I really thank them for that. I really thank also the Sergio uh, San Justin for the access to the Hook cohort and um, all the, the institutions that help us uh, do this work. And thank you to Nanopo for their support, too, because we have had a lot of help from them. So thank you. Thank you.